And today, Jeremy is going to be preaching, and he wanted me to read uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And it's up on the screen, and it goes as follows. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know the love of the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for your word, for your son, for your salvation that you've given to us freely. And we are so blessed to receive that from you. No matter the circumstances of our lives, Lord, we have you to turn to and to be grateful for, for the eternity that you provided for us with you. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, Bible Fellowship. Yeah, if you're the grade 6 to 8 Sunday school class, you can head to your classroom now. I'm going to slide this forward a little bit. Look at all these kids. Isn't it awesome? We had a, uh, a costume party at junior high youth group this past week. Max, yeah, you were one of the, yeah, we were there. We had 25 students, and it was insane. <laughs> yeah, I, I now have to drink an extra cup of coffee every Wednesday in order to show up here with the, the energy level needed to match those crazy kids. Uh, not only that, but we have lots of kids down in our preschool room and in our Sunday school on Sundays. Uh, our church has really been growing in that area of young families, and so there is quite a, a need still for volunteers for some of those different ministries, even on Sundays. Uh, if that's something that you're interested in, then you can always come talk to me and I can give you some more information. But uh, we have a great privilege to have so many children in our church, and we want to do everything that we can to steward that responsibility uh, faithfully. So... Give that some consideration. Yeah, today we are in the book of 1 John, as Jim had read, chapter 5. This is kind of a standalone message. It's not part of a series or anything like that. And the key phrase that I wanted to hone in on this morning was that phrase in that passage, His commands are not burdensome. So that's the title of my sermon. You guys know how I am with titles. I don't go creative. I just, this is what it's about. That way, when I archive my sermons on my computer, I can find them later. <laughs> Some of these pastors out there like these creative titles, but they're not helpful for me. God's commands are not burdensome. First thing I want to do is reread the verse. Verse 3, that that passage, that phrase comes out of, it says, this is John speaking. One of Jesus' closest 12 disciples writes these words, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. First thing I want to open with is this question, what does it mean to love God? That is, after all, the first and highest command in the entire Bible. Jesus himself confirmed that the two greatest commandments in all of Scripture are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We can summarize it this way, love God and love people. That's what God desires. But what does that even mean to love God? People have all kinds of different ideas in their minds about what that might look like and what it might mean, what shape or form it takes in a person's life, this passage here hones in on the need to keep God's commandments. Ah, commandments, really? Did we have to go there this morning? Nobody wants to talk about commands or demands or rules or obligations. Nevertheless, like it's something that you cannot avoid, number one, if you're going to be somebody who follows Jesus, and number two, if you're going to be somebody who reads Scripture. God's commands are all over His Word, and He expects us to obey them. And that, of course, is a great challenge. In fact, some of us bristle at the idea, some of us push back, sometimes we neglect or avoid even on purpose thinking about this stuff. But this passage right here connects your love of God to obeying His commands. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. So 
So one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that loving God is more than an emotional experience. Some of you know what I'm talking about, where you've been a Christian and you've got, sometimes it happens in the context of a worship service or things like that, where you have an emotional response to God that you would describe as great love for God. And there's nothing wrong with that, and that's a good thing, and we should experience that as often as we possibly can. But we should also recognize that loving God is more than feeling really good about Him. It also is directly tied to our actions, namely our obedience to His commands. In other words, you cannot have emotional highs with God and then go on with the rest of your day or the rest of your week in a way that neglects His commands and is in direct disobedience to His commands and say that you love God. That's not really how it works. Loving God is a combination of both our attitudes and our actions. We have to have both of those together. Let me give you just a simple example. And we'll just pick on this one. So Jim was up here five minutes ago, and he's asking for donations to the, fu- to the lift fund. We need a stair lift here at the church. And we need donations, and we need to fundraise for that, and that's a good thing. And if you go to Scripture, God calls on us to be generous God calls on us to not love our money, but to live with an open hand financially, being giving when we can. Those are commands in Scripture. God's commands also in the Bible talk about the need to care for those who are elderly and love our neighbor as ourselves. So those who struggle with the stairs, we should love them the way that we would want to be loved if we were struggling to get upstairs, which is to try and get a way to solve that problem. So you can go to different commands in the Bible that encourage or support the idea that we should be generous to that cause. That's a command, okay? Now, how are you going to handle that command, right? One is to ignore it or disobey. In other words, saying, I do have the means to be generous, but I'm not going to because it's my money and I earned it and I got other things I want to spend it on. It's not a very good attitude. And most of us would easily recognize that as wrong. But what about when we talk about wrong ways to obey that command? I can think of two examples. How about one? One is we give a little bit of money, we contribute some, and then we make sure everybody knows about it. Hmm? It's like, oh yeah, did you hear that the elevator fund went up a big amount this week? That was me, by the way. Wink, wink, you know? Mm -hmm. Aren't I something, right? And you act proud and arrogant as if there's, you know, something special about you and that you're better than everybody else and you deserve the attention and accolades for being generous. Does God like that? No. Is that loving God, even though you're obeying the command to give? Is that loving Him? No, that's loving yourself. That's loving your own attention, right? Your own perception in other people's eyes. So you can obey a command and do it in the wrong way. Or here's another example. Let's say you are sitting down and you're crunching your budget for the month or whatever, And you realize you do have some money to play with and you are feeling like God is compelling you and urging you to give to this fund. And so you decide you're going to do it, but you just are bristling the whole way, right? You're typing up your little e-transfer or whatever, and the whole time you're just, why does God always want me to give my money to him? I got other things I want to do, but I'm going to do it because he says so. Boop, send. (laughs) Is God up in heaven going, oh, that just pleases me. That just makes my day. My heart soars with the eagles. (laughs) He's like, dude, what's your problem? That's not the kind of giving I want. What does the Bible say? God loves a cheerful giver. That's right. So you can follow God's commands and obey his commands, but do them with a bad attitude. That's not loving God. Loving God is both following his commands and doing it with the right attitude. That's how we demonstrate true love. By the way, we know this from every other relationship in our lives. We know that we want other people to respond to us, not only in a healthy way, the right way, but also with the right attitude. Spouses, that's what you want from your spouse. Parents, that's what you want from your children. Friends, that's what you want from your friends. You don't want begrudging friendships, right? You don't want arrogance and prideful and looking down on others kind of relationships. You want a loving, genuine relationship. And I think that's why uh, John adds to this passage that last phrase, God's commandments are not burdensome. If we are obeying God's commands in such a way that we are showing Him they're a huge burden, we have a lot of room to grow in our love for God. I was thinking about this as an example. 
We have a problem with rules, don't we? <laughs> oh, nobody likes rules. And it starts at a young age. So I think it was, I could be wrong in my timeline. It was either this week, but I think it might have been last week. I can't remember where I was going, but I had to go somewhere, and I was in kind of a rush. And uh, so I had to take the three kids. I got three kids. I threw them in the van. I'm like, we got to go. Boosh, jump in the van, start driving down. Now, I live East End, and I'm driving down Shannon, and there's a light at the intersection of Shannon and Bennett. Bennett slash Wellington. Some of you know what intersection I'm talking about. And uh, that light is like five seconds from my home, and it drives me crazy because it feels like you just left the driveway, and then you're stopping at a red light. So it's such a blessing to be able to hit the green, right? You're always trying to time it. You're kind of looking in the distance like, okay, it's been red for a while. Green should be coming. Anyways, this is where I'm at in my head, right? As I'm trying to get where I'm going and I'm driving and it's like, oh, come on, get the green, get the green, get the green. Turns yellow. Oh, so I, I kind of groan, put on the brakes a little bit, slow down to a stop. And I'm like, stinking red. Or I said something to that effect. And Olivia from the seat behind me, she goes, Oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> I'm thinking like, you're six. <laughs> like, where are you going in such a rush? And uh, Olivia's this big, but she's got a personality. She says something to the effect, I can't remember exactly how she phrased it, but she said something like, why do we have to follow all the driving rules? Why can't we just get in the car and go? And it's like, you know, that's a good question. And sometimes I feel the same way, don't get me wrong. But it took me, you know, I, I took it as an opportunity to teach her a little bit about traffic laws and why they exist. And I'm saying, well, Olivia, like, our cop, and we meet in the middle. We have in traffic laws so that everybody is following the same structure, the same order, and really they're there for our protection and safety, right? That's why these rules exist. As much as they can be annoying sometimes, and we've all been here, if you've been here long enough, you've heard Pastor Craig tell stories about four-way stops, <laughs> right? They can be annoying, these rules, but actually they're a good thing, aren't they? I mean, imagine there just were no rules, and it really was, get in your car and go. I mean, we drive around Sault Ste. Marie, you're thinking like, uh, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm not even going to leave my house, because I know what it's like out there. It's crazy enough with the rules, never mind people who don't have any rules. Rules can be a good thing, can't they? Rules can be something that are not burdensome. In fact, sometimes living in such a way as to ignore the rules and just do whatever we want actually creates great burdens and hardship for everybody. This is actually one of the biggest objections that people have to God or Christianity or religion in general is this idea that God or Christianity or religion is oppressive in its rules. It's burdensome. It's overbearing. Why is God always on our case? Why is he always telling us what to do? Why is he always taking away all our fun? What is with this guy? Lighten up a little. And sometimes people have that attitude because they, to a degree, rightly perceive that God has a lot of laws. He has a lot of commands and expectations. And the attitude is just, you know, he should lighten up a little bit. What's the deal with all these commands? He's stingy. He's difficult. Everywhere we turn, can't do this, can't do this. And it feels like God is just this kind of difficult, overbearing, excessive, you know, dictator who just wants to command every area of our lives. But what we fail to sometimes appreciate is that he's doing it out of love. This is the key that John is getting at. God's commandments are not burdensome. We need to wrestle with this a little bit this morning. You know, here's the thing to remember is that this attitude, this pushback towards God's commands as being oppressive or burdensome is certainly not new, is it? In fact, if you were to take your Bible and flip all the way back to the first couple of pages, that's how the whole thing began. God created in the beginning this universe, this world. He created Adam and Eve. He put them in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it, and he created this beautiful home environment, and it says that he had perfect relationship with them. He walked with them in the cool of the day, and everything was awesome. And here's what it says in Genesis 2, 15 and following. It says, the Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So he gave him a job to do. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, 
You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. One of the things that I want to point out from this passage is God's overall vision for humanity includes a lot of freedom. Freedom. God puts Adam in a huge garden that has all kinds of fruit-bearing trees, all kinds of vegetation, all kinds of space, all kinds of things to do, and God gives what? One rule, just one, out of the whole thing. I've got one tree that I want off limits. Everything else is yours. And of course, what do we focus on? The one thing God said no to. This is our attitude, right, as sinful human beings. This is our attitude, just like Adam's. The first thing we want to focus in on is the thing that God said not to do instead of appreciating all the things that God has allowed us to do, all the things that God has given to us freely to enjoy. In fact, Christians sometimes get this really backwards. They focus so much on the thou shalt nots that they fail to appreciate and enjoy all of the freedom that we have in Christ. God has given us a lot of amazing things in this world to enjoy, all kinds of stuff. And usually, rather than appreciating the wide expanse of activities and foods and people and things that we can enjoy in life, we just want to focus on the few things that we got to gripe about. It's exactly how it's been from the beginning. There's nothing new. But I do want you to see that God's overall general attitude towards us is as much freedom as possible. God wants to make you as free as possible to enjoy as much as possible. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wanted for Adam in the garden. God loves freedom. He loves choice. He loves people to enjoy and experience the variety of his creation. That's what he wants. But he's got a few rules that he wants you to follow because there are ways in which we can use that freedom and abuse it for selfish gain or to hurt other people or for the wrong reasons. So he's just got a few checks and balances in place. This is how God's commandments come into play. He only gave them one restriction, which is to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And not only did he give them that restriction, he actually gave them a reason why. Because in the day of you eat of it, you will surely die. Hey, guess what, guys? I don't want you to die. And there's a tree that if you eat from it, you'll die. So don't do that. You'd think they would say, thanks for the heads up. Like, thank you for that. That's helpful information. Instead, their attitude is, hmm hmm, right? Is that really true? Is that really what it's all about? Why would God keep that tree from us? What if he's not telling us the truth? And this questioning or doubting is exactly what the serpent takes advantage of. So let's read that. We're skipping ahead a few verses. Genesis 3, verse 1 and following. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, so Eve is in the picture by now, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did God really say that? Are you sure? Planting seeds of dough. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, which God never said, by the way, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, a.k.a. God's lying to you. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, looks good, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave also some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And this is the first sin. The very first sin in the Bible came about from an attitude of seeing God's commands as burdensome. In fact, that might be the very essence of sin. That's one way to look at sin at its very core. Sin is when we look at God's commands and view them as burdensome rather than as delightful, as good, as life-giving. Here, the serpent comes along and he preys on Adam and Eve in the garden by planting seeds of doubt in their mind about the goodness of God's command. Did God really say that? Does God really mean that? 
Is God holding out on you? Don't you guys know that God is probably just keeping something good from you? He's holding back. His command is such a burden. And they look at it, and they see from their vantage point, the fruit looks good, sounds like maybe we'll get wiser if we eat it. What's the loss? And in that moment of deception, they fall prey to the tricks of the devil, and they eat, and into their life comes spiritual death first and later physical death. So God wasn't lying. He wasn't tricking them. He wasn't deceiving them. He was loving them by giving them commands. Friends, this is how God works. God loves you in part by giving you commands to follow because he knows how things work in the universe he created. This is God's world. You and I are created by him. We have been designed for a purpose. God knows what those purposes are. He knows how life is supposed to function. He knows how to bring us to life to the full, Jesus said, John 10.10. 10. And he lays out a path through his commands. The essence of sin is, a, is accusing God of holding out on us, of his commands being a burden. So we question, at the end of the day, his goodness. Some people have an issue with the existence of God, right? I don't really know if God exists, or I don't believe that he exists, or there's not enough evidence to support that he exists. That's a hang-up for some people. But for a lot of people, they probably can conceive of an idea that there's a God out there, but they have an issue with whether or not they can trust him. Because they look around this world and they see a lot of suffering, a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, a lot of misery, a lot of death, a lot of d- disease and destruction and all kinds of nasty things. And they think, I don't know if I can trust this God. I don't know if he's actually good. I don't know if he is really looking out for my best interests. That's a huge hang up for a lot of people, sometimes Christians included. Where you might look at God's commands and you think, okay, there's like 90% that makes sense to me, but then there's like 10% that I'm not so sure about. Like, why is God making this an issue? Why is God telling me what to do with this? I feel differently. I feel like these commands that God is giving are unnecessary or just excessive. They're a burden. Maybe God's not as good as he says he is. That's the idea. We accuse God of giving us burdensome commands, and that becomes a big problem. And that's exactly why John includes that phrase in his passage there in 1 John 5. God's commands are not burdensome. That is something we need to think about long and hard. Meditate on that. The big idea that I want to put forth to you is that God's law, his commands, are freeing, not enslaving. I've used this analogy before, but it seems like I'll just repeat it because it's the best one I can come up with. As a father who has children that I love, I give them rules to follow. And the reason I give them rules to follow is not because I want to make their lives miserable or withhold joy from them. It's because I want to make sure that they are making good choices and living their best possible life. When a parent puts up a fence in the yard, especially if you've got little kids, why is that parent putting up a fence? Is it because they are trying to keep their little children from enjoying all that the world has to offer? course not. It's because they're saying there is danger in the world when you go too far. And so I'm going to give you boundaries that will keep you safe. And within those boundaries, you can do just about anything you want. You can run, you can play, you can have fun. You can go from this corner to this corner, to that corner, to that corner. And everything that's in the yard is yours to have a ball with. Go at it, kid. Just don't go over the fence. Because once you go over the fence, you're in dangerous territory. Do parents put up fences because they hate their kids? No, they do it because they love them. Within the fence, there's freedom. Outside the fence, there's danger. And what does our rebellious little heart always want to do? Hop the fence, right? What's out there? What are you keeping from me? The The big idea is that we just don't trust God's goodness. God's commands are like pickets in a fence. God builds a fence for us. And he says, listen, inside these bounds, life is great. Things will go well for you. You will experience flourishing and abundance and satisfaction and joy and peace. Stay within the fence. And we go, I don't really trust you. Boop, over the fence. 
And one of the things that happens, just like a kid that might hop the fence, is that nothing goes wrong originally, right? You hop the fence and you're like, nothing happened. You know, I didn't fall in a trap door. I didn't get mauled by a bear. Doesn't seem that bad. Maybe it's not so bad outside the fence. And of course, we all know the answer is, we'll give it some time. This is a bad story. I'm going to throw myself under the bus. The first house that we bought had half a fence. Our whole yard wasn't fenced in. But there was this one uh, gate, you know, swinging gate right beside the house. And anyways, we were all in the backyard one day. Kids are out there. I think we had a bonfire going. And everybody's having a good time. We had some people over and this kind of thing. And little Bella was at that time maybe three. She was pretty young. And anyways, everybody's having a good time. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like, you know, where's Bella? And lo and behold, there was a crack in the gate about that wide that little two or three-year-old Bella could whoop, slip through. And unbeknownst to us, and to my absolute horror, she had slipped through that gate, crossed the street, and was playing at the park on the other side. We lived right across the street from a park. Now she's over there having a blast. <laughs> she thinks, this is great. I got full access to the slide. I'm over there. Woo! Right? And we go over there, of course, as parents, like, you know, white-faced, horrified. And yeah, technically, is it true that she went over there and nothing bad happened right away? Yeah, that's true. Um, it could have gone a lot worse. And it would have gone a lot worse if she had stayed there long enough. This is kind of how it is for us as Christians. We begin to disobey God's commands. There's some of them that we kind of take exception to, or we just are not as rigid with, and we're, you know, kind of like make peace with our sin a little bit. And what happens is, as time goes on, it seems like there's no consequence. Things are going just fine. I'm breaking God's command. I kind of know I am, and life doesn't seem that bad. Well, give it time. Give it time. God knows what he's doing. God knows that sin has consequences. Adam and Eve, when they ate the fruit, did they drop dead? They didn't, right? But death had entered into God's creation, and it was just a matter of time. The death was a slow decay, and that's exactly how our sin is. Sin is like a slow rot in the soul. It doesn't necessarily kill us the first time. It doesn't necessarily hurt us right away, but it will catch up to you. Therefore, we would do well to listen to God's commands. Here's how it's put in the book of James. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 says this, Be doers of the word, obey God's commands, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of God's word, but not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and then goes away and at once forgets what he looked like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres in it, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Great passage. James here is talking about Christians who know God's commands, but don't actually do them. He says a lot of people are like that. They hear the commands of God, they know his law, but they don't actually do it. They don't put it into practice. He's like, that's no good to you. Be somebody who hears God's laws and puts it into action. And he actually, in this passage, which is what I want to highlight, calls God's commands, quote, the law of liberty. Liberty, as in freedom. He calls God's laws freedom. That's telling. That is a helpful perspective. Again, most of us tend to think that laws are restricting. Not necessarily. If you put the right rules in place, the right structure, the right boundaries, it's actually freeing because it eliminates danger and harmful activity that will come back on you. You're free. In the fenced-in backyard, it's safe and free. Outside the fence, it's a different kind of freedom. See, this is what we get wrong. We think that freedom is doing whatever you want. That's how we tend to define freedom in our culture. If I get to just make any choice I want and no one's going to stop me, then that's freedom. Well, that's one way to think about freedom. 
But think about how that might apply to the person who is absolutely enslaved by alcohol. They are free to drink as much as they want. Is that person really free? Actually, they've, been, they've become self-enslaved to their own demons, right? And you, can, you could name a hundred different things of how people hurt themselves through their own choices, the choices that they make freely. But if your choices are not in accordance with God's good plan for your life, then they're actually enslaving, not freeing. See, freedom is not doing whatever you want. Freedom is living according to the design God has for your life. If you live according to the way God has planned life to work, that's freeing. But if you live in a way that just does whatever you want, you're actually choosing self-inflicted slavery. That's essentially how it works. God is always looking out for your best interests. This is one of the biggest challenges that we have when it comes to the Bible and God's commands. Sounds like God's always trying to rain on my parade. (laughs) Why is he telling me not to do things that I want to do? that I think might be fun and good because he knows they're not in the long run. They're going to hurt you or they're going to hurt others. They're going to end up in slavery and death, not life and freedom. So God is looking out for you. We need to look at God's laws the way James does, considering it to be laws of liberty, freeing commands. This is the love of God, John told us, that we keep his commands And his commandments are not burdensome. So let me just ask you this question. What commands are you hung up on today? Right? I just know this from my own personal experience, that if you're somebody who loves the Lord, you believe in the power and the authority of God's word, you want to be a faithful follower of Jesus, I mean, you've got some of those key building blocks in place. Generally speaking, 90% or more of the commands in God's word, you're like, yeah, I understand that that's a good thing. I understand that I need to obey this. I need to follow this. And that's going to be good for me if I do that. When I go astray, I ask for forgiveness and then I get back on track, you know, repentance, all that stuff. But there's usually a few in there where you're just like, I don't like this one. I got an issue with this one. This one seems to run counter to the way I want to live my life. Or it runs counter to the way I think about this issue. I mean, this is something that all of us have experienced at some point. Nobody has ever read the Bible cover to cover and been like, oh, I totally agree with everything. (laughs) Usually you're like, wow, why did God say that? Why did God do that? Why does God command that? What is that about? And you got to wrestle a little bit with some of those tougher commands that maybe don't land on us the way we like the first time or second time or tenth time we hear them. In other words, you can say in your heart or in your mind with John, God's commands are not burdensome, but when the rubber meets the road, sometimes we feel differently. When somebody greatly offends you, I mean greatly offends you, and that natural impulse rises up within you, to get revenge, to say something back as nasty as you can think of, or maybe if you're an aggressive person, to swing a punch or something to that effect, that desire is pretty darn strong. And in the moment, it doesn't seem like such a bad thing. It feels like this is exactly what this person deserves. And yet the command to love your enemies and to be forgiving And Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. And you think, you know what? That command seems pretty burdensome right now. It's pretty burdensome right now. I think it'd be very freeing to let it fly. That's short-term thinking, isn't it? That's short-term thinking. In other words, when you feel like God's commands are burdensome, here's what you need, the eyes of faith. You need the eyes of faith to trust that God is telling you the truth, that God knows what he's talking about, and that he's looking out for your best. Here's how, one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You probably all know it, or a lot of you do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, acknowledge his commands, and he will make straight your paths. I love that passage, because it just summarizes the Christian life in full. 
We need to trust the Lord with all our heart, even when it doesn't make sense. That's what the second part of that verse says. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I'm so glad that phrase is in there. Because if you go to any average Christian and say, you need to trust the Lord with all your heart, they'll be like, I trust the Lord. I totally trust him. What about when it doesn't make sense to you? And it's like, well, okay, yeah, maybe you got me there. Do not lean on your own understanding. Christian, how many, of you, how many times have you encountered a situation where it doesn't make sense to you what God is doing? It doesn't seem like what he's doing is for your good. It does not seem like he's looking out for your best interest. It seems like he's being difficult and oppressive towards you. It seems and feels like God doesn't really love you. He's not really there. How many times have you ever felt like that? I mean, all of us have been there. If you've walked with the Lord for any length of time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where you look at God and you're like, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense to me. And the reason that it doesn't make sense to you, and the reason you have a problem with it, is because you are leaning on your own understanding. I got news for you, friends. Your own understanding is not that strong. I know that's a tough pill to swallow. We like to think. We're intelligent, sophisticated people. And to be fair, I'm not trying to insult you. God's given us the capacity for reason and intelligence and intellect and thought. We should use that. Amen and amen. But let me ask you this. When your reason is measured up against God's thoughts, who do you think the winner is in that equation? That's why the Bible says, God says in the Bible, my ways are higher than your ways. As high is as the sky is, right? As the stars above the sea, so are my ways greater and higher than yours. When we compare the way we think about things to the way God thinks about things, we are out of our league. Which means, friends, you should expect some of God's commands not to make sense. Because God understands things that we do not. God has a capacity to see things in a way that is greater than we do. His ways are higher than ours. And if you know that to be true, then the right response is trust. In other words, you can say, this doesn't necessarily make sense to me. I don't understand what you're doing, Lord, but I believe that you know what you're doing, that you love me, and that you're looking out for me. And so I'm going to trust you with my whole heart, instead of leaning on my own understanding. Your own understanding will fail you. It can only go so far. And if you acknowledge him in all your ways, what happens? He makes straight your paths, aka life goes better. Life works the way God intended it to when we acknowledge him and walk by faith and not by sight. What commands are you wrestling with? What are you hung up on? What is the sin that you are struggling to repent of because you feel like, I cannot stop. I cannot live without this. I need this. I don't trust that I can have a full and complete life without it. What you're saying to God is, your command is burdensome and I don't trust you. And God says, I love you. I care about you. I know how things work. I am higher than you. I am smarter than you. I am wiser than you. Trust me. Follow my paths, and it will go straight. Now, here's the thing. Even if you agree with everything I've said this morning, and you think, yes, amen, brother. God's commands are not burdensome. When I feel like they are burdensome, I need to walk by faith. I need to obey anyways. I need to move forward with God's plan for my life. I'm all on board. At the same time, in your heart, you're saying, that sounds really hard. (laughs) Like, just obey God's commands all the time. I can't do that. It's too hard. To follow all God's commands. And you know what? God knows that. God knows that. That's the whole purpose of God sending his son, Christ, into the world. God knew that we would not follow his commands. God knew that we could never measure up to his standards. And he doesn't expect you to. What he does do is he offers forgiveness through the death of his son, Jesus. All the consequence for sin that we deserve, Jesus absorbed in himself on the cross. That's why we say Jesus died for your sins. To take away that burden, 
to grant us freedom, which means that we can still walk in the joy of the Lord even after you mess up, even after you've hopped outside the fence, even after you've wandered far from home, even after you've told God, I don't trust you, I'm going to do things my way. You could do that for 30 years. And God can still forgive you and bring you back home, make you part of his family, restore you, build up your confidence, and you can create a new life. The Bible tells us that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. When you put your faith in Jesus to take away your sin and he gives you new life, that's freedom. That's where all the freedom in the universe is found, freedom in Christ Here's what Jesus says about following his commands, even though we're not strong enough to do so. Matthew 11, verse 28 and following, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Here's the thing. If you try to obey God's commands without an appreciation for God's grace, you're setting yourself up for misery. Because what will happen is you try to obey God's commands, you fail, you feel bad about it, then you got to pick yourself up and try harder again, and you fail, and then you feel bad about it, and then you got to commit to trying harder again, and you fail, and you feel bad about it, and you just feel like this is too much. His commands are so burdensome. I can't do this. Friends, there's grace for you. God has grace for sinners. That is the beauty of the Christian life. God gives grace to sinners. He forgives us. He restores us. He puts us back on the right path. And here Jesus says, I'll walk the path with you. He says, if you are tired, if you are burdened, if you are exhausted, if you are feeling like life is beating you down, it's because you're doing it alone. So come to me, those of you who are tired, weary, burdened, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And he says, I will put a yoke on you, which by the way, sounds a lot like a burden. But here's the thing about a yoke. Those of you who maybe are like, I don't really know what that means. A yoke is essentially a harness that you would put on an animal. And that animal would use that harness to pull a plow or some kind of a, you know, some cart or something behind it, usually to plow a field. That's what a yoke is. So usually we think of yokes as an instrument of burden. Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He's like, no, I'm not asking you to carry all this alone. In fact, what sometimes farmers will do with a yoke is they make a dual yoke. It's two animals hooked together, a double yoke. And they side by side, shoulder to shoulder, plow straight ahead. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is saying. If you are tired, if you are weary, come to me, take my yoke upon you, and we'll do this together. We'll pull in the same direction together. And you know what? I'll do all the heavy lifting. I just want you to walk with me. Friends, that's the Christian life in a nutshell, is walking with Jesus, trusting his direction for your life, following his path, the one that he has laid out, and you're not doing it alone. You're doing it in his strength, with his help, with his grace. That's the, that is actually so freeing. That is a light yoke, and you will find rest for your souls. Man, when I think of that, I could use more of that in my life. My soul is not always very restful. Sometimes it's pretty contentious and stirred up and discontent and frustrated and annoyed and grumpy and miserable and cranky and stubborn. That's what I feel like in my soul half the time. And the idea that I can go to Jesus and find rest for my soul, it's like, yeah, why do I not do that more often? That's the invitation. Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. His commands are not burdensome. The Christian life is actually the best possible life. That's the summary of it all. In our sin, we always want to do things our way because we think we know better than God. The truth is, God's way is always the best way. And when we trust in Him and walk with Him, that burden is very light. You'll find rest for your souls. 
You'll have companionship and strength in Jesus. And you'll be moving in the direction of peace and joy and satisfaction in your life. So friends, what we're going to do is we're going to acknowledge what Jesus has done for us by partaking of communion. And I'll invite you to stand with me at this time. And uh, one of our elders, Paul, is going to come forward, explain what communion means, and he'll lead us in that time together.